So why are we here? As you take a look at the dining hall and the sign that greets you. We have a camp to run. That's why we're here. <laughs> so, and with that comes this, kids, or this, adults, or even this, working in a camp, you will see this. Or even this nighttime shot. Or this. Or even this. Things could happen like this. <laughs> shaved his head. I can't remember a reason, but he shaved his head. Is that Alex? No, that's uh, <laughs> Alan. What's his last name? Alan. Alan, J James Allen. Uh. <laughs> or maybe this. You can ask me who uh, instigated this and I'll let you know. Or you could do this, see the sunrise. Or possibly this, dress up. <laughs> Mr. Cheesehead, Miss Statue of Liberty, or even this. As counselors, here is how we end up. Or kind of sacked out. Or drinking our coffee in the morning. <laughs> but hopefully, we do not end up here after a week of fun. <laughs> but at least. We will have this angel with us <laughs> all the time. So where do we start? Yeah, and I've asked Tina to give us a little bit of history of CGC. So Tina, go, go for it. Thanks, Carl. So, you know, in a nutshell, <laughs> um, it was interesting when you showed that, that photograph of the front sign. It, you may or may not notice that it says, the Christian churches of Northern California, Nevada. It doesn't say the Christian church because when uh, the, uh, the Christian churches of Northern California and Nevada purchased CGC, uh, we were not really yet a region, not even officially a denomination at that point. We were called a brotherhood. And so that's why it still says the Christian churches, um, which is, I thought an interesting piece. I noticed that again, seeing that sign. So in night, you know, a camp, a organized camping in America really started taking off in the early part of the 1900s. And over the first, I would say 40 to 50 years um, until about, you know, up through the 60s, uh, churches and church denominations were very eager to buy property and establish a summer camp. And um, that was really a place for not only youth fellowship, but also um, in those days, it was really a place identified um, where faith formation could be uh, you know, uh, established. People could come learn about faith formation and about being leaders in the church. There was a very large emphasis early on on adult education, an education of the laity. And um, although that has waned in these kinds of settings, uh, the youth camp obviously um, really took off. And so in 1959, uh, a man named John Holland and another guy named uh, Josh Wilson started kind of poking around the Sierras for a location. The churches had identified that they would like to start a camp and buy some property. So um, 
they looked at some property up in the area where CGC is first. They actually tried to buy some other property first. The deal fell through and they were really disappointed. But somebody had said that they knew a, a, a guy who actually owned, he was a, um, I believe he was, he owned lettuce, uh, lettuce fields down in the Monterey area, that Watsonville. Was yeah, yeah, Watsonville, Monterey area. And he owned this huge piece of property near a place called Michigan Bluff. And um, he was using it basically for logging. And so John Holland contacted him. They met him, they went up, uh, which what is now Chicken Hawk Road was back then, it was a, just a logging road. And they had to go down through Michigan Bluff and then up what we call, uh, there was a, it was called Turkey Run, which was the name of the logging road and it went up to what is now Chicken Hawk Road. Looked at the property, they made a deal. The church had $50,000 to spend. That was the max. They weren't gonna spend any more than that, the churches. And so they were able to work a deal out with this guy and he let them pay, he let the churches pay over time. And so I think they paid $800, uh, you know, I think they paid less than a thousand, it wasn't even a thousand dollars an acre. It was, he really gave the churches a great deal. And I think at that point we bought 450 acres uh, on the ridge, which is where the camp is now. So that was in 1959, the deal went, the property was purchased in 1960. And unfortunately in 1961, a huge wildfire came through and burned the entire camp. There wasn't any structure yet. There wasn't, it was just trees and, and land. They hadn't really begun to develop it, but there was a huge loss of timber. Um, some of the old trees, obviously, if you know anything about wildfires in California, old trees will survive. You know, that big basin fire that happened last year, uh, a lot of the, all the structures were lost, a lot of trees were lost, but the really old redwoods down in Big Basin, they survived. Um, last year. And so the same thing happened at CGC. The old pines, the old cedars survived, and many of those trees are still there today. So it was a very unfortunate kind of tragic experience for the churches in Northern California at that time. Um, what was left was about 12 inches of ash and red dust. And so it became very um, dirty and messy to go there. They started with youth camps, high school camps primarily. They built some platforms and uh, just camped out on platforms. And back then they were either cooking outside completely or they, there apparently was some, we used to own the land all the way up to Baker Ranch, which is where you turn off the main Forest Hill Road to go to camp. And they had some kind of a building up there. They would cook food and then drive it all the way to camp. Sometimes they would do that. There was one gal apparently that cooked uh, for years up there for the youth camps. So a lot of the youth camps at the beginning were study camps and work camps. So they were coming up and working. They were digging pit toilets and building platforms and that kind of thing. So um, that was really how it was for the first number of years. They were called Faith and Life Institute. Back then they weren't um, called like CYF camp you know, or Cairo camp. They were really much more focused on, again, study and then work uh, at the site itself. So a little bit of a different flavor than what we have today in our program. Um, so the first real building besides the platforms and the pit toilets that, were, that was built were, was Claire House. And that was Adelaide Claire was a gal who I believe Ted, I, wasn't she a member of First Christian? I think she was a member of First Christian Church. She was from Sacramento. Her husband had owned a big car dealership in Sacramento. He had passed away. And so she donated $15,000 for Claire House to be built. And that uh, it didn't pay for everything, but it paid for most of it, believe it or not. You could build a building for $15,000. And that really was, um, it was back then, it was called the group house is what they called it. And it was used obviously for lodging for adults, but also it started to serve as the dining hall. And that's where the main kitchen was. For those of us who have been going to camp long enough, we remember eating at Claire House 
and um, used to be there was an atrium right in the middle of it, an open air atrium with picnic tables or tables out there as well. That, uh, that was uh, remodeled in the late 80s. The atrium was enclosed to allow more indoor seating. And it served as the dining hall, believe it or not, until the 90s, at which point the region decided that it was time to build a, a, a real dining hall. And so the Irvin Dining Hall was built. And um, boy, that changed everything. I mean, it changed everything in terms of a more centrally located. It used to be you'd stay down in the Bobbitt cabins and have to walk, you know, half a mile for every meal, which was great exercise. But uh, now we have a dining hall that's more centrally located. It's large, it's air conditioned. It's got a huge commercial kitchen compared to what Claire House was. I'm just amazed that they cooked for 120 kids and adults out of that little Claire kitchen. Now, when I look at the whole situation, it's pretty remarkable. So the Claire House was the first thing built. Then the whole Bobbitt area started to be developed um, in the later in the 60s, in the mid 60s. And those cabins in that lodge were primarily um, constructed by the labor of what was called back then the Christian Men's Fellowship. And men from the churches all over, I'm sure there were some women up there too, but the reality is, is that it was kind of a project of the men of the region to go up there and build cabins. And they did. Um, uh, they established Bobbitt Hall and the cabins in a circle around. So if you look at the original master plan, what's interesting about CGC is that Claire House was supposed to be only one of about four group houses just like that. All that land behind Claire House was supposed to have three other buildings just like it. So there would have been four Claire House kind of structures for um, primarily focused on adult education and adult lodging. An interesting tidbit, it never happened. It probably never will happen, but it was part of the master plan. The only other big structure that happened later in time was um, the amphitheater. And the amphitheater was built um, by a group of alumni who had gone to camp there in the 60s and early 70s, including Tim Holland, Chris Holland, Noelle Irvin, who's now Noelle Pope, her husband, uh, Ross Valentine, and uh, Bertram Chatham. Those folks were really in initially um, kicking off that whole alumni amphitheater project and got donations from the region uh, at annual meeting and stuff like that. So uh, that was established. Um, other than that, the cabins used to have like a wood burning stove in the middle of them, if you all remember that. And there were not bathrooms, just shower houses. So now it's, uh, you know, they, they fixed those up in the late 80s and put bathrooms into the cabins, which was really awesome. Made a really different kind of camping experience um, than going to the group shower yeah. house. And then, gosh, you know, Leanne, I can't remember when we had those cabins built out in the summer camping area. I'm gonna say it's probably been almost 10 years ago now, um, probably sometime around 2011 or 12. Uh, what's now called the Holland Summer Camping Area used to be where still all the old platforms were. When I went to camp as a kid, they had the platforms, wooden platforms with giant canvas tents. Uh, on them. And we would, uh, the younger kids, when I was young, we would stay out there. So you could have two separate camps. But back then there were like 120 kids in camp. So they had to use the whole property. You know, they would have some kids out in the tent area, some in the Bobbitt area. We don't see those numbers anymore uh, in one program. Um, so those, those tents and cabins were in place. And then we start, they were really just failing structurally. So uh, work camps and volunteer days, we started, you know, staff at CGC eventually started demolishing that stuff. And there's still one platform left. And that is if you're going down the road uh, from Claire House into the summer camping area on the left, there is um, one platform left. And uh, that's about the only one. Other than that, we have the summer cabins now which are very simple structures. They have a couple of windows, no bathrooms, still get to use the shower house, but
but there's a really cool cook shed there if you're camping out there or staying out there you know that has a fridge and out it's all outdoor you know and the men in lafayette actually built that and um they would come up for many years and and, and do those kinds of structures so since then we've added lots of stuff over the years you know campfire pits and volleyball court and uh, gaga pit now we have a gaga pit and the swimming pool of course one last piece of history about swimming at CGC. Uh, up until the pool was built, which I believe was in the early 80s, um, every week, I think about this now in terms of liability, I can't believe we did this, but every week on Wednesday, all the counselors would pile all the kids from camp into their cars and they would drive all the way down to the North Fork of the American River and we would swim in the river and jump off a bridge into the river and we called that Oxbow. It really wasn't even Oxbow. Oxbow was a reservoir down the road, but we would go to what we called Oxbow and jump off the river, jump off the bridge into the river and, and spend the whole day down there. Other than that, you had to hike down Volcano Creek Trail, which is straight down the mountain. There used to be a dam on Volcano Creek right below the camp. And um, they dammed, the church dammed that up way back in the early 60s for swimming. And there was like a water hole. I mean, it, was, it wasn't a big, huge area, but it was enough to swim in. And they built a little dock and they called it God's Dam. And we would trudge up and down the mountain to swim in the river and the dammed up. It's not even a river. It's a creek. We swam in the dammed up, dammed up creek. Huge logs would be floating around. It was, it was definitely a natural experience. I mean, we were just, it was definitely, you know, the nature experience of kids in the 60s and 70s swimming in the some creek in the Sierras. So, but once the pool went in, all of that stopped. There was no more travel. They sold the land that Volcano Creek um, sat on. So we don't really own that anymore. And the dam was taken down. And now we have a chlorinated swimming pool, which is much safer. And um, we certainly don't have a hundred kids piling in the back of pickup trucks, hauling down pulling down the highway, you know, okay. that's the liability nightmare. Now I think about like, wow, we did that. Um, so it's, it's got a really rich history. And I, I wish I knew exactly how many thousands of people in the Christian church have been there for a camp experience or a, a, an adult learning experience. I do know that lives have been drastically and positively impacted and changed there for the positive and for the good. Um, I think still it is obviously what we think of as most churches think of their church property as sacred space and sacred land. And it has um, continued to be a place I think where people can experience a, um, a true sense of, of Christian community and, and have that experience of, of uh, of the spirit and of God, you know, being very much alive in um, in that place and among us who feel like we can be our full selves somehow in that in that place. And I know that as young people, they will often say, you know, camp's the only place where I can. If I go to CGC, it's the only place where I feel like I can just be fully who I am. You know, all the masks can come off. And so that is a very rich and beautiful and beautiful thing. So that's it. I think, I mean, there may be, I'm sure people have, we have so many stories, but that's really the history. Right. That's great, Tina. And uh, when you say the masks can come off, it's kind of an ironic thing right now. So that's great. Thank you so much, Tina. If you have any questions for Tina, just put it in the chat and she can maybe just chat back to you on those kind of things, or we can answer them later on. So, well, that, I mean, camps uh, obviously would not be camps without a campground, but a, a camp program definitely needs a director. So I'm asking Ted to talk to us about being a director. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I, I'm very happy to see faces that I haven't seen very often recently. Christian, hey. Remember the old days? Um, <laughs> directing. Directing is, is not the entry-level position. 
<laughs> you you kind of have a, to have a sense of of what's going on. And I actually counseled six times before uh, I was ever tabbed to be a director, and and very blessed to have been director or co-director. I think thirteen times. Um, so I want to talk about what a director is and just uh, some basic headings. Director is responsible. You're responsible for what goes on at that camp. You're responsible for things being done right. You're responsible for knowing what Leanne expects of you to have happen at camp and, and how to operate by what our community covenant is and our, our guidelines are and, and legal things too. Like if something comes up and we learn about something like an abuse situation, you got to do the, the legal correct things too, mandated reporter. Um, so all of that means that the director has to be somebody who can be paying attention to everything that's going on. Director sets the culture for camp. I mean, for example, some questions. Will the camp be adult-led entirely or will you make room for young people to have a voice? And that's more Cairo and CYF age. Um, how will you administer the rules? You know, young people have lots of energy and are always interested in hijinks, particularly with no parents looking over their shoulders. So they'll want to bend the rules. How do you then uh, set a culture that encourages, as, as Tina was saying, people to be themselves, who they uniquely are, and yet be responsible to each other and to the covenant that they have, uh, that th we're all living together with while we're at camp. Um, the culture is, is how people understand how you're operating and living together. Director sets a vision for camp. You have a curriculum provided, but in every year, a director needs to go to camp with some sense of what you hope will happen at that camp. What you, you envision will be the experience that people will um, take home. You know, for example, in 2017 in particular, my vision was that we would emphasize and all the participants would learn something about have uh, the worth and dignity of all human beings. Director recruits the staff. I mean, you will get a number of names sent to you, people who uh, express interest, who send in forms, but a lot of times people don't send in forms and you just got an kind of have your eyes open and have contacts that help you recruit the staff that you're gonna need. Director is a leader, not a boss. As a leader, you develop the plan, but you make sure your staff knows that they're part of a team, that, that they feel like they're important and that there's this team that works together and you're facilitating, you're guiding, you're leading it, but you're not just, hey, you, over there, so that there's um, respect. Director pays attention to every person in that camp, both the adults and the youth, the nurse, everybody, because everybody has needs. Everybody's going to be up there, and different people will, will be uh, struggling in different ways. And the director's job is to kind of be in tune with everybody. Director facilitates communication. All the adults on the staff, the counselors, the nurse, the keynoter, everybody needs to know that they have a voice in how the things are going. Our disciples' sense of ourselves and our theology is about, you know, the spirit speaks through everybody. And the director makes that possible that everybody feels like the spirit speaking through them can be heard by the larger group. Um, 
And the director is the one who keeps their eyes and ears open for anything that comes along that's a problem. Like if there's a bully or someone who's super depressed and you need to be responsible then to address those things in a way that's best for all, not just merciful towards the person who seems to be the identified uh, problem. The director puts together the program for camp. You come up with a plan, what's gonna happen when, how you're gonna make it happen, who's needed to do what, and to get all that in motion before you arrive. Um, director is the person who connects everything. Uh, the director uh, is the point of communication between the site staff, uh, Sandra Heck, and the actual people who are in the camp and also the connector between that camp and region. Uh, and then for me, something that's not really in any kind of uh, job description that I've ever seen for directors, it's, I've always found it very important that the director help um, or, or make it a, a, a priority that that camp um, have some representation of, of the full diversity of the family faith. Um, different ages, ethnic groups, so that when uh, you have young people perhaps come from, you know, different ethnic backgrounds, they'll see, oh, this camp, there's somebody who looks like me. Um, one of the greatest uh, uh, weeks I ever had was when I had Clarence Johnson keynote. And it was, <laughs> At first, I thought, gosh, he's, he and I are so much older than these kids, but he connected, and it was great. Thank you so much. Um, so next, I want to have Larry come in, and he's going to give us a definition of what consular is. So Larry, why don't you take away? First of all, the nuts and bolts, the basic responsibilities of, of the job of a uh, counselor. First of all, to be an adult leader in a cabin of campers. Now, the cabins can have up to nine campers and, and a counselor, but this year with uh, the COVID uh, kind of distancing, probably about five campers at, at the most uh, in, the, in the cabin. The counselor sleeps in the cabin and is present with the camp whenever the camp campers are in the cabin. Uh, unless another staff person is supervising the cat. Then it entails being an adult leader along with a, another counselor, co-counselor for a family group engaging in a variety of learning, craft, and recreational activities. Being a member of the whole camp staff working alongside the other adult leaders to help create a camp experience which helps open campers and other staff to an experience um, to the reality and presence of God and helps facilitate the experience and experience of what is called the beloved community. Participate in all of the activities of camp along with campers and other staff, except when given time off for rest and rejuvenation. Help lead games, low rope course activities, songs, evening activities. Sit with a group of campers at meal times at the table and be a mandated reporter, which means reporting to camp directors any indication that a camper is suffering any kind of physical, sexual, or verbal abuse by anyone in their lives. And then I, this next section I call goals of the counselor. And first of all, to keep the campers safe, emotionally, physically, spiritually. And that includes requiring campers to keep the camp covenant, which they sign, maintaining appropriate boundaries that keep everybody safe. Help every camper and staff member feel welcome and to know that they belong, to know that the universe knew they were coming, as some put it, and had prepared a place for them. Or another way to say it is that they belong as children of God among the people of God. 
guard against any form of bullying or racism, help create an experience of Christian community for the campers, and to remember what feels like hard work for you, the counselor, will be experienced as magic by the campers. Help the campers experience the wonder of nature and to experience God in the midst of creation. Help communicate a God vision for the world and for the campers life. And help the campers know that they are called to love God and love their neighbors as they love themselves, which means they need to love themselves. And part of what we do is to help them to learn to love themselves and to know that God made them and they are therefore uh, worthwhile human beings who are loved by God. And then uh, a couple of characteristics of a counselor. A counselor is called to be a non-anxious presence because some of the campers and especially the newer ones and the younger ones may feel some anxiety at camp being away from home and being out in, in the woods, up in the mountains, and maybe especially feel that at night. So need some uh, extra attention uh, around the campfire or in the, the cabin at night. Uh, be empathetic, feeling, seeking to feel what it is like to be in a camper's shoes or another staff person's shoes. To, to try to sense what is going on with them. And then I thought the, the Camp Counselor Covenant for uh, CCNCN uh, offers some other characteristics of the Camp Counselor. And I just simply like to read that. In order to help create an environment in which faith may be deepened and Christian community experienced, I agree to be an authentic adult by setting an example of a Christian lifestyle. I agree to be physically and emotionally present by being enthusiastic about participating in all of camp. I agree to be a good listener by understanding that it's more important that campers be heard and understood than it is for me to speak words of wisdom. I agree to be part of a team by pulling my share of the load. I agree to be a servant leader by supporting the directors and supporting my directors uh, other staff and campers. I agree to be shockproof by maintaining my cool and my sense of humor. I will be firm when necessary, but will not embarrass or belittle campers. And to especially be gentle when there needs to be some form of correction, and especially gentle when in the presence of others seeing that happen. I agree to be human by being able to acknowledge my mistakes and accept the consequences by knowing my limits and accepting help from fellow staff. I will try to learn from others and allow campers to learn from each other and from me. I agree to be clear, open and honest in my communication in order to uh, be a model for campers. I agree to model safe touch and appropriate behavior for campers and other staff. When I am in doubt about the appropriateness of behavior, I will seek the counsel, or the counsel of my directors. And then I'd like to finish with just these uh, few words about my um, own experience. Counseling at CGC is a rewarding, faith-building, skill-building, and fun experience. I've done 26 weeks of camp at CGC, a Zoom camp last summer, several Cairo midwinter retreats, a couple of Feb camps and nine weeks of camp in other settings. I think given then also church retreats and pastor retreats at CGC, I probably spent close to a year uh, in camp and retreat kinds of settings. My faith has deepened and my life has been enriched because of those camp experiences. I hope you will prayerfully consider signing on with Outdoor Ministries to share your love for God and your love for others at one of our camps at CGC this summer. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. That was a beautiful testimonial. Thank you so much. Um, so I think we're gonna have a little bit of a conversation between Carl, Mike, and Carl about our experiences as a counselor. I wanted to bring this into the thing, and I think I want to just kind of give you guys an example of uh, 
what it is to experience being a counselor. And uh, I, I think I'll start it off. Um, uh, Mike and Carl here are one of my best friends, uh, I think. We've been in counselors, uh, I don't know, we, we couldn't figure out how many, and five, six times, um, mostly uh, CYF camp. And, but we've also been at other events as well. I mean, uh, annual gatherings and RYC meetings and you name it, we've been in it. But uh, I wanna just relate one of my experiences uh, back in 1986 is the first time that I counseled back in Minnesota region, which was called the upper Midwest. And we drove six miles, six hours, excuse me, six hours to the camp. It was in Newton, Iowa, and I lived in the Twin Cities. And uh, the funny thing, when you drive from Minnesota to Iowa, you could tell the difference when you cross the border because of the smell. <laughs> you cross into Iowa, it turns into cow territory, and you can just tell. <laughs> just a little tidbit if you ever do that. But anyway, the, the experience I had was with another counselor there that you may have heard this. I did it one time in an annual gathering, but a long time ago. That uh, this gentleman was uh, older than I was. I was only, uh, I'll give you my age here. I was 35 at the time. And I thought about that this morning and said, oh my God, that's 35 years ago. Holy moly. Um, anyway, but um, this gentleman, he was older than I is, but he was just, just what I would think as being a counselor. He, he was a lover of peanut butter. And he, he put peanut butter on everything at all meals. Didn't matter what he had, he had peanut butter and pancakes peanut butter on celery, peanut butter on, uh, I think spaghetti, I think he put peanut butter on it or something, I don't know. But he had peanut butter all the time, but he also uh, envisioned, I think, what I would like to, what I like hopefully have been a counselor, very genuine, very open, always participating, doing things. So I think my experiences uh, have been plentiful, um, but I can't, I mean, sure, there's hard times. I don't want to take all the time, you guys. Just butt in. I really appreciated Tony's prayer to get us started off. And you know what? What she said, I think really it all boils down to for me. And that is I am where I am because God touched me when I was at camp. And for me, camp started as a youth in Southern California in the mid-70s. I went to a place called Lock Levin. Uh, Several of you have been, some of you have been there. Many of you know where that's at. So, but you know, I, uh, I loved camp and God touched me in many ways through the counselors, through my fellow campers. But I never imagined that um, one day, I never thought about being a counselor someday. So, and like many uh, after college, I, after high school and then into college, I kind of drifted away from the church for many years. And it wasn't until I had my own daughters and they started going to camp at CGC that I, I sort of got reconnected and then Peggy Allen really gently encouraged me, actually pushed, gently pushed me to consider being a, a counselor. And uh, so at, at 41 years old, I did my first Feb camp. And then a couple years later did in 2004, I think was my first summer camp at CGC. And then almost every year until my last one was 2017. But, um, you know, my years at camp have been some of the most intense and meaningful and challenging uh, and exhausting and rewarding weeks of my life. Um, exhausting because it's just 24 hours a day, yeah. you know, for a whole week. It's uh, really exhausting and, um, but so rewarding in that, uh, you know, sharing uh, stories and listening to these campers' stories, uh, sharing their lives and their trials and difficulties and joys is uh, very intense and very rewarding. I'll let you jump in here, Mike. Okay. Um, so it, 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 is, it is appropriate that the three of us are all together. I think some of my, my fondest memories of, of CGC have been spent with these two men. Um, camp uh, is transform transformational. It is inspirational and 
I can't, I can't believe sometimes that over the last 20 years that uh, um, I've, I've had the opportunity and the privilege to spend time there. Um, it, was a, it wasn't an easy start for me. I, uh, I was pushed into it, I really tricked into it. I, I told this story the other day to, to, to Carl and Carl um, that I had been working with youth at, uh, at uh, Concord and um, that uh, uh, Josh Elson was the uh, director of the high school youth. Leah Gosshorn was the director of the uh, um, middle school kids. And they had basically recruited me to become a, a, um, a mentor and a participant with, with the youth there at Concord High or Concord, uh, Concord Church. And um, I loved it, I enjoyed it. I, there was a time in my life where I thought that I wanted to be a teacher or I, want, I did want to be a teacher and, and never really was able to follow through with that. Um, and there I was finding myself involved with, with high school age youth and just loving every minute of it. But I also um, was a little uncertain about it. Um, there was a long gap between, and for church for me was probably between the ages of 10 and 42. 42 is when I first got into recovery. And so as a, as a part of that, 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 that sense of needing a spiritual connection, um, my wife, who was a, a member of the, of the church, just, you know, I became more than a holiday visitor, started, you know, going to church on a regular basis and uh, finding, finding a place for myself and trying to understand. And, and I certainly found the right church because, you know, there was, you know, um, you, know you learn as you go um, and there was no expectations. And, and that was a wonderful thing. But after about a year of working with youth, uh, Feb Camp was coming up and, you uh, uh, Josh and Leah were recruiting me hard to become a counselor. And I kept saying, no, no, no. You know, I, I, I didn't feel comfortable with that. I had never experienced camp as a, as a kid. Um, that, that was totally new. And I also were still very uncertain about what I might have to offer. Um, you know, my, my, my recovery wasn't a secret in itself, but church camp scared the hell out of me. I mean, quite <laughs> literally, it, it scared me. It's like, I didn't know much about church kids. You know, I'd now been working with the youth there and they seemed just like me, but I thought they hold something that I didn't understand. They had something I wanted, but didn't know how to get. Um, so I turned this down a number of times, the, the idea of going to, to Feb camp. And that's when we were in Scotts Valley. Um, when Josh and Leah came up to me another time and, and told me that, you know, they really wanted me to consider it. They had just discovered that there was gonna be a shortage of men um, at, at this Fed camp. And, you know, I played on my, my empathy, my sympathy, my guilt, uh, and uh, I, I agreed to go. And I clearly remember going and, and meeting a couple of people you know, as soon as I drove up and it was like, this is great, this is wonderful. And I walked into the, 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 the hall that we were using at the, at the camp. And I can't remember the name of that, that camp. But at one point I found myself out on the deck and Josh and Leah came walking up to me and said, hey, you're, you're here and you're, you're great and stuff like that. I said, I said, I don't understand though. I said, I'm looking around, there's plenty of men here you know, how, why did you, did they, and, and they admitted to the fact that they had lied to me. They knew that I would be great. They knew I would have fun. And the only way they knew how to get me there and commit to this was to do that. And um, I have been a camp convert ever since. Um, uh, the involvement uh, I, I came was, you know, or, or that, that, that happened was, just so much better than I'd ever imagined. And the youth have truly been inspirational to me. Um, you know, I have heard from them a number of times that I had also been inspiring to them. And that level of gratification, you know, just 
made me push that much harder um, to, to be that, to build relationships. Um, from counselor to then director, um, one of, the, one of the, the true gratifications of that change in my life was the fact that every time I, when I went from counselor to director, every co-director I had was a former camper of mine, from Claire Richardson to uh, Rochelle, uh, Rachel Rhinus, and now to, to Haley. Um, I love these young women. I, I think that they, they, they brought something to, uh, to me, to um, our, my experiences. And, uh, and something in recovery we have it with the 12 steps and that's to share openly your experience, strength and hope. Um, and that's what my counseling experience has been around um, to, to be that role model, to be that mentor, be that coach, sometimes be that disciplinarian, um, whatever it takes. Um, but it was always about building relationship. And, and, and I think the three of us, our friendship, our relationship uh, was also um, inspiring to many of the young men that, especially young men that we, we worked with. Um, it, it's possible and it's, you know, it, so much happens there uh, at CGC, um, love and friendship and relationship. And certainly it, it is about the idea that, um, that these kids, um, they, they do find God on that mountain. I, I know that I did too. Um, and I also know that how many of these kids um, their lives outside of camp are so much more difficult than we can imagine. And I've known more than a few who white knuckled it, their lives between Feb camp and camp and fall fest, you know, knowing that that was the only thing that kept them going. And, you know, we provided that space for them. We provided that level of growth and that, that level of love. And uh, certainly, we watched them build the friendships that have lasted forever. Um, and it's true for us counselors as well. Um, there, there isn't a person here. I think actually only one person here that I didn't really know before, um, but you know, I have great love and admiration for, for everybody that's passed through the, you know, down Chicken Hawk Road to that camp. And, and so Carl, I, I wanna say to you, especially again, thank you for for doing this, just as, as um, Tony said, um, it's it's amazing. You're an amazing guy, and uh, thank you for doing that. I don't know. I was just blown away with Mike. <laughs> so I don't have anything else to say. Uh, but I, I think I, I think we should mention that we are supposed to be there for the kids. But it just turns out that it uh, what ends up being that we become a family as a counselor, director, nurse, and chaplain and keynoter as a family during the summer. Go ahead, Carl. Yeah, you know, there's one other thing I want to add, uh, and this is really important to me. Uh, both of you guys have been mentors to me when I was getting started. And the single best piece of advice I got from you, Carl, I remember vividly, it was at uh, Asilomar, uh, just be yourself. Yeah. You know, you told me, just be yourself. And that has stuck with me. And that is the single best piece of advice I can give anybody who's considering uh, being a counselor, just be yourself, be authentic. The kids, they can see it. They can see when you're being authentic and when you're uh, being real and genuine and honest. So right. I just want to pass that on. Right. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Mike. I love Thank you guys. guys. I love you guys. <laughs> All righty. So what do we got? Okay, we're going to jump right into the nitty gritties. So Leanne, you're going to take it away. Hey, thanks. Um, I've just been uh, really enjoying listening to all the experiences of camp and um, those warm, warm memories and what it takes to be a counselor and what it takes to be a leader. Um, these are incredible things that you've been sharing today. And here I go with the nuts and bolts, <laughs> fun times. Um, first of all, we would like to have on the um, CCNCN, the Christian Churches of Northern California, Nevada, 
we'd like to have on the website a place where people can um, drop us a note if they're interested in being a counselor. So we are definitely gonna work on that. Or if you're interested in being a musician, a keynoter, a nurse, a um, chaplain, a director or a counselor, uh, we're gonna create something that says, drop your note here and we will um, get back to you. But what we do have on that website at ccncn.org is a staff application. And it's under um, ministries. When you go to the main page, when you open up ccncn.org, main page says ministries, one of the tabs across the top. And the drop down menu, there's outdoor ministries. If you click on that and search around, you'll find a blue link to the staff application. On that staff application, you have to provide your social security number because we do a background check. And that is for everyone, not just brand new counselors, but everyone has to have a background check every two years. And we ask that that application be done in a timely manner because um, uh, Jim has to turn in those background checks and receive the um, results before camp starts. So there's a deadline of uh, March, no, sorry, May 31st um, to have this staff applications filled in and online. Um, also in that um, staff application, it asks for a short letter, a short note from your pastor as a reference letter, and um, it can be signed right there on your application. The application has to be downloaded from the website, printed, filled in, and mailed back in the old fashioned way <laughs> because well, we don't have that live yet. Um, then if you are chosen to be a counselor, uh, you'll get notified and you'll get a phone call or an email to ask you if you're available and, and willing to actually be a counselor this year. Then there is an online boundary training class that you have to take. Uh, you can do it at home at your leisure and it's, it probably takes an hour and a half to do that boundary training. There is also an, a, a training that we will do this year on Zoom that will be on May 22nd and it'll be two or three hours because we need to um, talk really carefully about our COVID situation and have everyone understand what kind of protocols we're gonna be using out at camp this year for, for the COVID situation. And that will be different than in years past. Um, we're gonna to try to do a lot of small group things, many, many things outdoors. We might have to have staggered seating at meal times. Um, so we will discuss all those things and learn about all those things for this year. Also, there's a long waiver of um, to hold harmless the region of anything that might happen or um, um, because of COVID this year. Uh, and so there's that going to be added to the staff application that needs to be signed uh, to hold the region harmless. Um, the financing is another little area. Uh, it costs almost $400 to go to camp for a week. And our counselors are also billed um, by UCCR. And it's, um, the cost is probably more like $380 in reality. And so we ask that the counselors uh, try to come up with that money, but it can be in the form of a church scholarship. Your, your own local church might help you go to camp fully. They might pay that in full. Or you could um, also ask for a regional scholarship. We have some money for counselors um, in the regional pockets. And um, if you have any that you can contribute yourself to, if you could contribute a little bit towards your, your fee to go to camp, that'd be great. Um, you're expected to arrive 24 hours before the other campers arrive. So in a, a Normal year, that means we arrive on Saturday afternoon and the campers arrive on Sunday afternoon. But this year, it's going to be counselors and staff arriving on Monday afternoon and um, campers arriving on Tuesday afternoon on the campus. Uh, another thing I ask is for that you be really timely in answering emails and phone calls because as things get closer and closer to camp, we have to, to move along. Um, another area is counselors in training. We love to have CITs at camp and they need to be 16 years old 
they're usually between 16 and 18 and in high school. And on their application, it's also online on the CCNCN website, their um, application, click on CIT application, requires and asks for two references about your ability to work and to work with kids. And it is the same financing situation. It still costs us $380 to have a counselor in training on site. So we would ask your churches um, to help you um, with that fee. Uh, a CIT is always with another adult. You're never alone. Uh, you will have um, a cabin with another adult counselor in that cabin and a family group with another adult counselor in that cabin and in that family group. So um, unless there's any questions, I think I've covered everything I wanted to cover <laughs> for the nuts and bolts. And just to remind you that camp is so much for the kids. You go as a counselor and you, um, you remember that camp is not for you, but it's for the kids, but that we all, we all experience the love and care and, and uh, just the love of each other while we're there. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. That was, that was great. You're a guru in this stuff. She has done marvelous work in the last, I don't know, five, six years in putting all this registration stuff together. And of course, last year was a big, 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 big challenge to outdoor ministries. It's still a challenge. But uh, Leanne, you're coming through with flying colors, in Thank my you. opinion. So we have a couple other opportunities uh, that I'd like uh, to talk about. And Shonda was going to talk to us about uh, chaplaincy or even key, um, mm -hmm. a keynote, excuse me, got that wrong. <laughs> Thank you. You got it totally right, Carl. Um, and you know, I was, I was sitting here and thinking, I only went to church camp once. I was a Girl Scout. I went to all the Girl Scout camps, uh, even the ones in the winter in tents. I'm not sure why we thought that was a good idea. But the one time I went to church camp, I have absolutely no recollection of anything that the keynoters said which was probably for the best because it was an evangelical church camp. Um, what I remember are the counselors, the counselors who saw the light of God in me and called me into this work. Um, I don't know that they'd be thrilled with the way I'm doing the work, but nonetheless, I, and so as I was watching the counselors talk, I found myself thinking, as a woman who needs more and more good men in the world around me, I am so glad uh, that the male identified kids in our camps get to be around such healthy models of masculinity. Um, I was thinking about the fact that the women identified counselors that I've worked with uh, have provided such inspiring models of what it looks like to be a strong woman as well as a faithful woman, um, that we actually have counselors who know how to support people who find themselves in different places along the gender spectrum, and how beautiful it is that a church camp can honor the divine in all of our kids. And I was just finding myself very moved by that as I was uh, being witness to all of you. And uh, so that said, um, the keynoting and chaplain jobs are have hands down the easiest and the most fun. Um, they're the lowest stakes ones, but they are really, uh, really beautiful uh, opportunities. And so what I, I wanna say is that they tend to be flexible uh, around the gifts and skills of the keynoter and chaplain. So they vary from camp to camp, but um, in my experience as someone who ended up wearing kind of both of those hats, um, there, there is something really sweet about having a little bit extra freedom to show up, encourage, and support the counselors and directors because um, they're all so focused on all of the kids that it's nice to be able to see and honor um, the folks who are making it all happen. Uh, so that's one of the fun things about that gig for me. Um, I kind of see the chaplain as a little bit of a release valve. All of the counselors and the director are kind of on the front lines of all of the challenges that, um, that our youth are going through. And 
the I love the fact that a few years back, more than a few years back, uh, we realized kids are in a pressure cooker these days. It is so hard. There are so many challenges um, that our camp wanted to be more responsive, more supportive, uh, create more support systems for, uh, for our youth. And that's where the chaplain uh, element kind of showed up. And I really loved that. I also think the keynote, if you'll forgive me for switching back and forth, I think they kind of are integral to each other. Um, I think the keynote role offers the gift of reminding our youth what's even bigger than themselves. Um, at the various developmental stages of our campers, uh, there's a lot of work that uh, children and youth have to do on figuring out who they are uh, in relationship to others. It's sometimes very self-oriented work. And so at its best, the keynotes can help uh, kids recognize how beautifully beloved they are of God and how God has a plan for them to do something big in the world. And so the big payoffs for me uh, of this work have happened years later when I've seen some of the youth I've worked with saying, hey, I'm doing this amazing work of social justice in the world now, or the way I'm raising my child is really intentional around making sure they know about how God loves everyone equally, or I'm going into ministry so that I can make sure other kids learn the same things I did. Um, so I don't want to underplay the role of the keynote. There are lots of beautiful opportunities. I think the important thing to remember is that, um, that the children or the youth, depending on who you're working with, they're going to respond to different content based on their developmental stage. Uh, and that's an important thing for us to think through. Are they going to respond more to visual cues? Are they going to respond more to interactive programming? Uh, will they be able to ride out uh, a long talk? Uh, or are there other ways of engaging them so that they can internalize a really powerful spiritual message that is also deeply inclusive? The only thing I wanted to add is we were joking about how the keynotes job is very easy because you have to do every morning and then you get the afternoons off. I will say the thing I am most glad I did was something that I was taught by my mentor, the Reverend Greg Turk from uh, the from all people's community church down in Los Angeles. He did something he called the ministry of hanging out. And so when I was at camp. I would hang out at the picnic benches every afternoon during free time because sometimes there are kids who don't know what to do with themselves or don't know which kids to hang out with or they're trying to figure out a thing or they need to process something um, and they're not sure who to process it with. And the keynote is a neutral person, not your pastor, not your counselor, not somebody that you're gonna have to deal with in day-to-day -day life. I ended up being good, safe, neutral space for some really beautiful, vulnerable conversations with some of the most powerful people I know. Um, so those are all the things I wanted to throw into the mix about those two roles. Excellent, Shonda, excellent. And I always remember your camp times with myself and my, we always had a great time. So Nancy, are you there somewhere? I can, you wanna talk a little bit about nursing? I am. So I one of the things that I wanted to say is it's so good to see so many of you and I haven't seen you in a while and it's fantastic because this is definitely um, some of the places where I have had some of those great spiritual uh, feelings uh, come to light. Um, I am a nurse. I've been a nurse for 46 years now. It's been quite a journey <laughs> and um, my history goes back to I think 2004 and my one of my daughters said, can you please come to Feb camp? Because if we don't have a nurse, we can't do this. And so I'm like, oh, OK. And it was Mount Hermon. That was such a beautiful place. Um, and I think Larry Love was either keynoting or directing. And he hit me up for summer camp. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I really can't go to summer camp and be a whole week with my daughters. But I will commit to after that. So I think I started in 2006 and somewhere in between there. Thank you, Leanne. 
and got me to counsel for Cairo at Feb Camp. And I decided that is not my age group. <laughs> so I've been um, CYF high school ever since. Um, the nurses role in working with all of you, and it's definitely the directors, the counselors, the chaplain and the keynoter, because we all um, need to stay healthy and safe and take care of our um, youth um, is gonna be really different, I think this year in that we've always had a check-in uh, at the beginning, but for the most part, it's been, how are you feeling? Are you well? Great, okay, give me your meds and um, let me check your head for lice. <laughs> so we're gonna add on definitely a more detailed questions as to your wellness, do temperature checks, all those um, questions you've been asked every place you go um, about you know, illness will be included with that. Uh, still in the everyday, uh, keeping our folks well is checking in with them, uh, distributing the medications for them, and this seems to be a little bit more of a challenge than it's been in the past. Um, I have found some of our, um, our youth just have more and more medications that over the years they have not um, had before. And so keeping a good, honest record of that um, has sometimes been a challenge, but um, hopefully we can work on that. Uh, I always like to be in a family group. I think there's that wonderful ability to see the kids in a different light, um, more relaxed, more playful, and you know, not nearly as serious. Um, I have been asked in the past to do workshops, and most of my workshops have revolved around health. And um, I think one of the, I don't know if it's favorites or, or most interest has come about is on sex talk, where I literally just talk about um, physiology, anatomy, um, what it is to have contraception, all the different types without any um, talk of prejudice against one versus another, and then open it up to questions. And I have had some great, great, interesting questions uh, in the workshops. Um, with that checking in every day, I, <laughs> well, thank you. Um, with the checking in every day, we have had folks that have been ill, and this is going to be a little bit different uh, coming, you know, this year where, you know, oh, you have a little cough or you have a little runny nose, you know, I usually just, you know, gave some cough medicine or medications. We're going to have to be a little more diligent about is this really related to um, just a cough and a cold or is it truly COVID? So um, we have had to send a few folks home who have been ill and hopefully this year, everybody comes healthy, stays healthy. Um, we really use our tools um, of masks and hand washing and distance uh, to stay uh, nice and healthy. Um, with that in mind, I have been the one who uh, needs to be aware of how we spread certain uh, germs and uh, if there are, you know, blood spills or things like that, how to best clean those up so that we don't spread anything. Um, I am also a mandated reporter, both as a camp, as a um, a counselor, I mean, as a nurse, as a uh, teacher myself, um, and going to camp. So lots of roles and um, lots of ability. But I think as everybody else has said here, this experience for me as an adult after my kids were all gone uh, really has been the best experience. I love summer camp, um, just like Mexico mission and um, feel like I often get more out of the keynotes and the um, relationships that we have built here 
um, than the kids sometimes, which is just wonderful. Um, I hope that's everything that the nurse does and that it's um, clear. And I hope some other nurses would like to do that. Uh, I am an RN, we do take LVNs, uh, but we definitely need to have a licensed person who has that background to be able to keep everybody safe, especially kind of during this pandemic time. Yeah, many a times I've seen Nancy with that huge bag she carries all the time all those meds he has to distribute and she runs around at the lunch times and supper times and breakfasts and gives even myself meds so that's wonderful nancy that's great um haley you want to talk a little bit about ryc yes definitely and i also kind of just wanted to add in that um nancy you've always been kind of like the camp nurse but also like the camp mom too everybody always wants to come see you you know to <laughs> when when they're missing their mom or things like that at camp you know Nancy's not just a nurse but she serves in so many capacities and from my I mean Nancy's been working at doing this since I was a camper and um that is truly one of our very favorite parts about camp is our nurse Nancy so thank you for all you do um, so yes, yeah, so RYC, um, the Regional Youth Council is um, a group of uh, youth that um, grades, so it's open um, anywhere from grades 9th through 11th grade. Um, you can enroll for a little bit, like you can be a, um, a, on the Youth Council as a senior for a little bit, but we do ask that you um, end your duties at annual gathering of your senior year so that you can enjoy your summer camp um, without any re extra responsibilities and just really um, enjoy your time as a, as a senior. Um, and there's a lot going on there being a senior at camp. So um, that's the age uh, ages that we take for Youth Council. Um, youth Council is an amazing group of individuals that um, you can have been to camp many, many times. You can have never been to camp. Um, we love to get experience um, from kids of all different, you know, backgrounds and ages and um, experiences. And we just kind of come together to put the um, fun things together for camp, I guess you could say. The uh, RYC is in charge at church camp um, of planning the evening activities as well as planning the workshops. Um, so you kind of get a behind the scenes look at um, what you know goes into the planning. If there's games, certain games and things that you may want to play or you think would be fun. Um, then you can join the youth council. You definitely do not have to be a leader. Um, we take uh, people that are, you know, of all kinds of personality types. Um, that's what makes the youth council so unique. Um, and they uh, are also a group of individuals that really keep a close eye on camp and kind of can be the eyes when the counselors and the staff can't see um, exactly what's going on. You know, there might be something going on behind the scenes. And this has happened to me many times where a um, youth council member or even someone who hasn't been a youth council member have come up to me with a problem or an issue that they see, um, you know, kids are kids. And so a lot of that sometimes can be um, something that we might not catch on to right away. So um, if you are a youth council member, I do expect that you um, act accordingly and, you know, also um, just make sure that you're being a friend to everybody um, and making sure that everyone is included in all the activities and that they're just there and they're having a lot of fun and, um, you know, and so making sure that all the campers, um, all of their needs are met. But um, yeah, it's a it's an awesome experience. Um, we also are taking applicants right now and through April 12th. Um, I asked that they're in the mail April 12th. So if you know of a youth that um, they would be interested in doing this, they just have to be a high schooler. There's really not a whole lot of requirements beyond that. Um, there is an application process where they fill out um, a little questionnaire and get a letter of recommendation from their pastor. Um, and a lot of meetings nowadays are done via Zoom. So that part is nice. Um, we do try to, because we are such a diverse geographical region, um, we try to meet via Zoom a lot of times. Um, so if you know the youth that would be interested in joining the Youth Council, please, please, please send them my way. You can have them email. Um, applications are out right now. 
that's available on the youth council. Um, I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, on the web page um, on the outdoor ministries Facebook page, you can find the link to it and also on the regional voices newsletter. Um, Paige, is there anything else to add in? I don't know anything about um, general youth council if that application process is right now or it, it's later, right? Hi guys. So general youth council um, does their application process in the fall and um, letters come out in December. So we've completed that application for the next two year term, which is Van Eyck and Hudson. Yay! Huge. Um, and that way they can also um, collect some tools and other resources to bring back to our own region. Um, and yeah, so that's exciting. And that's all we really know right now. It's kind of play it by ear, right? And how we can do things online. So thanks, Hales. Um, yes, so this is the time if you have any questions, uh, this would be the time to ask. I didn't see any um, going through the chat. But I've got one. Um, I can't imagine I'm the only one who's thought of this and you guys have maybe even discussed it, but has it been a thought to have COVID tests before camp, you know, like 24, 48 hours before we show up, campers and staff? Leanne, you want to answer that or? Would that be invasive? But you know, that's lots of people are doing that. Like I'm going to Mexico with my dad and we've got to get tested to get back in. You know what I mean? So. Really, I should pass this off to Nancy. We have discussed it. Uh, when we discussed it, we thought it was fairly expensive. Um, right. But some people with that have health care can get them um, free. Um, so right. I, I don't know. To require it would probably not be doable, but sure. to encourage it might be doable. <laughs> Leanne, yes. Um, I I know you see Davis. Um, it's called Healthy Davis Together. They do a uh, saliva test, and they they test the whole campus weekly, and oh. anybody. Anybody that has anything to do with Davis can can come and do this saliva test. All you have to do is be able to come up with a little bit of spit in your mouth. <laughs> um, and I'm I'm wondering if it if it might be possible to set up a little contract with them and and maybe even just see if on their way to camp uh, mm -hmm. we might be able to ask people to stop off at UC Davis and and do the saliva test. That'd be awesome. Well, that's good to know. It does it take about a day and a half. How fast do they get the results back, Larry? I think it's about a day and a half. Oh, OK. So, so that's. And, and that's day been day. one of our comments, is the test tells you at that moment in time but it doesn't mean that two days from now, you can't you know, be contracting it. And even though people are supposed to isolate, um, you know, they're still around people. <laughs> and isolation you know, is really, really difficult right now for a lot of people. Great. Great question, Hannah. Thank Great you. Question. Any others? Yeah, um, this is, um, Yes, I'll plug staff too. Everyone should go on staff. This is more um, recruiting kids to come to camp type question. There are a couple of churches that rent space from us in Vacaville, and I would love to be able to share camp with them, but I just didn't know if that's something we do and um, just wanted to hear thoughts from Outdoor Ministries around that. I say absolutely. I think the more the merrier um, for, um, you know, as long as they were um, understanding of the different procedures that we'll have in place and um, would abide by those. Absolutely. We, the more the merrier, that's not a requirement to be a disciple to go to camp. Um, and we would love for any youth to join us. I'm sure Leanne, you would echo that same. Yeah. Not even on our application, it says bring a friend to camp. Um, yeah, we'd be open to that. Well, 
considering uh, inviting UCC the young people, but then we thought if we did that, it might get too big. Um, but if it's a um, so people that you know and they worship in the same building as you, I think that sounds really good. Thank you. I, I thought so. I just wanted to confirm that before I invited. Yeah, and we typically don't get too too high of a like a number to where we have to, um, you know. But there would be a part where if camp were to be full, but that would be it. So yeah, that would be awesome. We would love to have them. Thanks, Bentley. All right. Uh, Haley, I just wanted to let you know I put in the chat um, Presley's phone number. Thank you. I just messaged her just now. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. So excellent. Megan was going to join in. She texted me back that she had gotten that, and but I, she never joined in. <laughs> That's okay. Must, <laughs> must have had a connection issue or something. All right. My good people, my panel of experts, I want to thank you very much for all your, your talks and your wisdom. So now the task at hand is to go out and <laughs> make counselors. <laughs> As they say, make disciples <laughs> and bring them in, make counselors and make directors and make keynoters and make purses and bring in the flock. <laughs>